So I prepared for this welcome in an unusual way. I'd offered to do it, but I'd forgotten that Esther would need my song choice by Wednesday when I hadn't even thought of the theme. And I thought, help! And help came in the form of a firm conviction that my song choice should be peace, perfect peace. Um, it did seem a strange song choice, given that I'd been looking at scenes at Kabul airport where Afghan people were gathered, desperately trying to get on a flight to countries where they wouldn't feel their lives were endangered. And they were even wading through sewage pipes to reach the front of the queue. There wasn't much peace there. And there hasn't been much peace around the world over the last few weeks for the people caught up in floods in Europe, Bangladesh, China, Nigeria, Venezuela, and many other places around the world. There hasn't been much peace for those who've lost their homes in fires in Western states of the USA, in Greece, and in Turkey. And there's still conflict in areas around the world, such as Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, Venezuela, and many more places. And this morning, we've heard of the residents of Louisiana fleeing their homes in the face of a pending hurricane. And we have all experienced the anxiety of living during a worldwide pandemic. So I looked for a dictionary definition of peace and I found a few. Peace is a freedom from disturbance and tranquility. Peace is the state prevailing during the absence of war. Peace is a stress-free state of security and calmness that comes when there's no fighting or war, everything coexisting in perfect harmony and freedom. Well, I don't think there's ever been a time when the peoples of the world have coexisted in harmony and freedom. There didn't even seem to be much peace and harmony in biblical times, despite peace being mentioned 97 times in the Bible, according to my lectionary. So I turned to a biblical definition. What does peace mean when it's mentioned in the Bible? I read, biblical peace is more than just the absence of conflict. It is taking action to restore a broken situation. It's more than a state of inner tranquility. It's a state of wholeness and completeness. Biblical peace is not something we can create on our own. It is a fruit of the spirit. So when we pray for peace, what are we praying for? We pray for peace in the world, for a loved one to find peace when they're experiencing difficulties, for the departed to find peace in the afterlife, in the presence of God. It's sometimes difficult to see where Jesus' peace is in the world, but the perfect peace of Jesus isn't limited to situations, circumstances, or even pandemics. In the darkest of times, his perfect peace can be present. And this perfect peace is not easily understood or explained. Rather, it has to be experienced. When I look at the images on the television and read or hear the news, I know that more than ever, I need to have faith that Jesus' peace surpasses all understanding and then it guards our hearts and troubled minds. When I pray, I will be asking for others and myself to experience that peace as a fruit of the Spirit which the world cannot give or take away. I will be asking to be given the wisdom to see where I can take action to restore a broken situation and a way to achieve wholeness and completeness. So now we'll sing, Peace, Perfect Peace is the Gift of Christ the Lord.
apologise there. I pressed the button and moved you on a bit. Sorry. Um, we now have our reading. Our reading and I believe Polly reading for us. Thank you, Johnny. Unmute. That was what I needed to do. So uh, today's reading is from Acts chapter 8, uh, verses 26 to 40. <clears throat> Uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down to Jer from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb silent before his shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation from his life for his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Amen. Thank you, Johnny. I believe we're going to sing our next song now. We're going to sing together. Thank you for saving me.
Adrian is now going to lead us in our prayers. We come to our time of prayer and intercession. Lord, be with us in our worship. Help us to focus on you. And Lord Jesus, be the centre, recipient, and responder to our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those caught up in the suddenly altered and regime-changing situation in Afghanistan. We thank you for those who have been working to evacuate refugees. And we pray for the souls families and loved ones of those who have died to make this happen. We pray for those people still trapped in fear of violence and for their very lives. Stay the hands of those who would harm them. Build up tolerance. And in the aftermath of this evacuation, Lay out paths for people who still need to leave Afghanistan and to find a welcome elsewhere. And we pray for those many thousands of Afghans rescued by British forces. We pray that they are welcomed, settled and find sanctuary for their future lives and contribution to our country. Lord, we pray for our church. Make us a welcoming community, ready to see the stranger, draw to their side and offer them the good news. We have pledged to welcome those leaving prison and those fleeing from Hong Kong. Move your energetic spirit among us so we may be prepared for these and for any other newcomers to our church as we reopen our doors. We pray for all those in the medical and caring professions. Give them stamina, insight, expertise and empathy in their work. And we pray 
for them and thank you for how they have all responded to the COVID crisis. And we pray for all those in need of medical treatment and support, praying particularly for those in our own church who are troubled in body and in mind. And in a moment of quiet, we bring those known to us before you. Lord, we pray you enter our lives this week ahead. Surprise us with your voice, your spirit and your guidance in the words and actions of others. Help us to welcome the stranger in whose guise you offer opportunity, insight and shared understanding. So we may live as you foretold and live out the saying, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Adrian, for your prayers. We will now sing together again. Speak, O oh Lord.
I'm going to hand over to Matt now. So over to you, Matt. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Esther. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you all. Um, today, we're going to be continuing our little series on where God meets with us. This time, looking at the experience of Philip and a really remarkable encounter that he has with an Ethiopian eunuch, which Johnny read for us a little bit earlier. I think there are four key places, note the inverted commas there, where God meets with Philip that we can learn from. So let me pray for us and we'll dive into the passage. Father, be with us now as we look at your word together. And we ask that you would meet with us by your Holy Spirit, just as you did, Philip. Speak to us, guide us, lead us, change us, and take us where we need to be to be effective in your service. Amen. Right, so where does God meet with Philip in our passage? Well, the first place he meets him is in exile, because Philip is at this point effectively on the run for his life. He's supposed to be in Jerusalem right now, but the intense wave of persecution that's broken out after Stephen's stoning has made it impossible for him to stay. And if you flick back to the start of the chapter, you'll see that Saul is going door to door, rounding up Christians and dragging them off to prison. So Philip has found himself in exile in Samaria to the north. This is absolutely not part of his plan. This is not where he wants to be. Yet this is precisely where God meets with him. And through his preaching, a large number of people come to believe in Jesus. Miracles are performed and people healed, and there was great joy in that city. I wonder how many of us have felt at one point or another that we're trapped, either in a place or a phase of life that we don't want to be in. How many of us have felt restricted by circumstances beyond our control, and we just feel like we have to wait glumly for our lives to get back on track? But the truth is that there are no circumstances beyond God's control. And the place of our exile may just be where God plans to meet with us most richly. After all, it's where Philip received his call to head south again. But rather than stopping in Jerusalem, as he might have hoped, the Lord calls him on still further, onto the desert road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And note that God doesn't give Philip a final destination here only the road he's to start out on. And that's important because this is the second place that God meets with Philip, on the road, on the way, during the journey. It's here that he has a seemingly chance encounter with an Ethiopian official, returning home from a period of worship in Jerusalem. Now, I don't think we could blame Philip for thinking nothing of this because people from all over the world visited Jerusalem on similar trips and the road he was on would have been used quite often. But the more we look at our passage, the more it seems like this was no chance encounter at all, but instead a meeting painstakingly arranged by God. Think about it. The Ethiopian and Philip were traveling in the same direction. So what that means is that each had to have left Jerusalem at exactly the right moment and be traveling at exactly the right pace in order to keep up with each other or they would never have met. Fair enough, we might put that down to coincidence. But when they do meet, the Holy Spirit prompts Philip to keep pace with the man's chariot, rather than hanging back at a respectful distance, which is what I would have done. At the very same time, the Spirit prompts the man to be reading Isaiah, and not only Isaiah, but a specific passage relating to Jesus. Since Philip was standing close by, he could hear what was being read because they read aloud in those days. He could not ask for a clearer invitation to start up a conversation about Jesus. God has taken care of every detail. And what I love about this story is that, as we said, Philip doesn't even know where he's going at this point. As far as he knows, this encounter is just a random step on the journey that God is calling him on, not the destination itself. But in God's economy, Sometimes the journey and the people we meet there are just as important as the destination. In God's economy, there are no chance encounters, only opportunities for us to meet with God and listen to the guiding voice of his spirit. And I wonder how many such opportunities we walk past each day because we aren't paying attention, 
we're too focused on getting where we're going. Sometimes when we think we know God's plan, we put on blinkers and rush to get there, and we miss out on who and what he has for us on the road. The third place that God meets with Philip is in an unfamiliar and unexpected face. The Ethiopian is Gentile, someone from a completely different culture to Philip. Remember that up until this point, the gospel has only really been shared within the Jewish community in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. It's only recently that a church has been established in Samaria, and only because Philip was forced to go there. Despite not getting along well, Samaritans and Jews have many customs and beliefs in common, but the Ethiopian is an entirely different matter. It's likely that he was a Gentile God-fearer, which means someone who worships the true God and respects the ethics of the Bible, but doesn't feel able to follow the Jewish law around diet and circumcision. And this explains both why he had travelled to Jerusalem to worship and why he was reading Isaiah. And it gave Philip an opening to connect with someone with whom he probably had very little else in common. But the question is, why did God choose this man in particular for Philip to stop and talk to? Think about how much trouble he went to to arrange the meeting. Now, it, it could be that as an official to the Queen of the Ethiopians, this man held great influence and could talk to other people about Jesus when he got home. That, that could be part of it. But I think the bigger reason is simply that he was worth all that trouble with God because he was made in God's own image. And that applies to every single person on this planet, obviously, however different they are from ourselves, which is why the gospel was never supposed to stay contained within Jerusalem. And why at the start of Acts, Jesus tells the disciples that they will be his witnesses, not only in all Judea and Samaria, but to the ends of the earth. And this passage is the start of the fulfillment of that promise. Are we actively on the lookout for that image of God in others? Especially when they look, sound or act very differently from ourselves? Or do we only expect to meet God in people who look like us? in the familiar, in the safe. The fourth and final place God meets with Philip is at the start of a new calling. You see, later on in Acts, Philip pops up again, almost 20 years later. He's still in Caesarea, where our passage leads him, but by now he's known as the evangelist because of his calling to proclaim the gospel to other people, a calling that started with an unplanned visit to Samaria and a surprise encounter on a dusty desert road. But the thing is, prior to, this, prior to his exile, Philip had quite a different calling. He was one of the seven, effectively one of the first deacons, if you like, whose job was to make sure that the daily distribution of food to widows and the church's other charitable projects were run fairly and efficiently. And the whole point of his role was so that other people, namely the apostles, could focus on preaching and evangelism. Philip certainly wouldn't have seen himself as an evangelist then, and perhaps he would never have become one had he not been forced to leave Jerusalem. I wonder how he felt as he arrived in Samaria and then embarked on this new calling. Disorientated, probably. Shaken by the loss of routine and identity. Probably worried about the people he was supposed to care for back home. How would they get on without him? Maybe he was uncertain of his own ability to preach and perform miracles, as the apostles did. Whatever he felt, we can be sure that God met with him in the upheaval that accompanied this new calling. Because the Spirit may lead us into different roles or ministries at different times of our lives, but where God guides, he always provides. And it is when the easy and familiar are pulled out from under us, and we are asked to do new and scary things, that we are most reliant on his strength. The question is, do we turn to him in our own moments of weakness? Do we look to lean on him when we feel that task is beyond us? These are hard questions to answer and uh, something we all need to reflect on, I think. Let me pray for us as we finish. Father, thank you that you are a God who loves to meet with us to involve us in your work of redeeming people all over the world. 
Thank, Thank you that you call us to new and unfamiliar places and people. Wherever we are now in our walk with you, whether it feels like a place of exile or waiting, or a long journey with an uncertain destination, or a place of new and difficult responsibility, help us to see the ways in which you are meeting with us and sustaining us every day. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to try something a little bit different now. Um, hopefully, if we can get the breakout rooms to work, uh, Esther's looking a bit worried, but I have absolute faith in her. Um, so we've thought a little bit already this morning about um, where God meets with Philip, where God meets maybe meets with us as individuals. Um, I think it would be good for us to think about where God meets with us as a church, as Hawthorne Baptist Church particularly. So we're going to try and split into two breakout rooms, I think, if that's all right, Esther. Um, and so my group are going to think about where God meets with us um, because Hallfield is on a journey of um, is on a journey as well and maybe for some of us that feels like a period of exile or waiting while we work out what we're doing about buildings and our future ministry um, so my group are going to think about that um, and then the other group if it's alright are going to think about the people that God has put across our path during this journey, and maybe the new calling, if there is a new calling that we feel God is giving to us. Um, so I think I'm going to give this 10 minutes, and for the first couple of minutes, maybe we just um, share any reflections or ideas, anything we think God has said to us um, through the passage, um, or any thoughts we have about where we are as a church around those questions, and then if the last five minutes or so could be um, praying into those thoughts, that would be great. And then we'll come back together in about 10 minutes' time. That's all I said. Okay, thank you. for us as we finish our service yeah absolutely thanks matt father as we go out into the rest of our weeks 
send us out in peace to love and serve you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, thank you, Chris and Adrian, for leaving our service this morning. That's lovely. And that's the end of our service. So I'll stop our recording now. <laughs>